Good evening. And welcome to PCR webinars focusing on valvular disease. My name is Scott Lim from the University of Virginia, and we're going to be talking about mitral valve disease. And I have a distinguished panel of colleagues here with me. I have Dr. Paolo Denti, Dr. Fabian Praz, and Dr. Edith Lubos. Uh, welcome, all of you. So with that, we are going to proceed ahead with this uh, webinar focusing on mitral valve disease. And really the concept behind this is less is more. And here are the learning objectives. And to fully understand the importance of minimizing mitral regurgitation followed by, following transcatheter mitral valve repair is the key importance. We also hope to have you appreciate how that the innovation in transcatheter repair devices can help achieve better outcomes and better long-term durability. And then we're going to invite you all to participate in case-based discussions that highlight the clinical value and issues of these devices. Um, so with that, I'd like to go on to our, our next slide, and Dr. Paolo Denti will lead us off. Paolo. Hi, Lim. Hi to everyone. Thank you for having the possibility to share what's the experience of Sarafaele. As a cardiac surgeon, it's really exciting to having uh, the chance to talk about uh, uh, these new transcatheter technologies. Uh, transcatheter technology uh, woke up really in a, in a good start because uh, we know that uh, uh, we had acute procedural success, which is uh, um, assessed as two plus residual of MR. As a surgeon in our uh, pr daily practice, two plus of MR, it's not at all a success. And we, our group demonstrated that impact of two plus residual MR either in surgical, in uh, functional or in the generative settings takes out really uh, better, worst outcome in terms of survival and recurrence of more than three plus of MR. This is consistent with other groups, like example, the Swiss registry. In other, uh, in other words, it is better to have no MR at uh, the end of the procedure. This is another demonstration where you can clearly understand that the survival with the green line, it's free of event if you go out with one or less plus of MR. Two plus of MR is not as not to be considered anymore uh, a successful treatment. Clearly, it's difficult to obtain the optimal uh, material repair with transcatheter technologies in order to abolish and chase the colors without having uh, a gradient, because we know that having a gradient could be not beneficial at all in either settings of degenerative MR and in setting on functional MR, which can be even worse. So we have to pay attention to have no MR and no gradient. This is a concept that maybe uh, not all the people that are working on degenerative MR knows. Our group demonstrated many years ago with the surgical Dutch to edge that there is a uh, reserve a valvular reserve in degenerative settings. So pay always attention when you uh, measure a gradient in uh, in a patient with degenerative MR in the operatory room or interventional cardio uh, cardiology cat lab, because sometimes if not it's not a rule you can have a reserve of opening of the valve because the conformation is different in degenerative settings and in functional settings. This is my, my final provocation. We are exactly between Schiller and Charybdis because uh, uh, as soon as you increase the number of uh, devices that we want to implant in order to achieve a better result, we increase the risk to have a gradient which is not beneficial. We have, so we have to balance the results in terms of reduction of mitral regurgitation, which has to be, as we said, less is more, but also less gradient is is more for our valve and also for the patient in terms of quality of life uh, and uh, survival. How can we achieve this? We have to select the best patient and we can do this because there are parameters that we know now that are uh, 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 consistent with a better result and we have to choose the right device. We know that there are devices that can help us in order to achieve this type of results, so no MR and no gradient.
So th Are that's there, excellent. And we have an opportunity for any questions from the chat from all our colleagues out in the audience. But in the meantime, uh, let me turn it over to um, Fabian and to Edith. Any thoughts on uh, Paolo's presentation there? So yes, thank you, thank you very much, Paolo. It's uh, it's an excellent uh, presentation, and you know I agree with uh, with the main message. One of the of the important debate right now is to know uh, whether uh, the reduction of MR has the same meaning in uh, functional or, or uh, secondary patient and in primary patient. So what is your opinion on that? Because the co-op data tend to show that uh, maybe uh, grade two in functional patient is is enough for the prognosis. What, what is your what has your thought on that? Uh, thank you for the very appropriate questions, but I think that uh, uh, what we have now in terms of data, so it's not my opinion, but also in terms of data, the co-op demonstrated that 2 plus FMR, it's enough, but differently from what Mitral FR demonstrated, the, bet the result of co maybe can explain the better of the result of the, in terms of, of survival of the patient. So there is no doubt that in functional uh, regurgitation, a better result correlates to better outcomes, and no doubt also in degenerative, because our group demonstrated this, other groups in Europe, and also the Everest trial demonstrated with the postdoc analysis that if you have a good result in six months in degenerative cases, you can have better or the same result in terms of reduction of mitral regurgitation in degenerative settings for five years. So no doubt that better result at the beginning correlates with better uh, residual and recurrence of mitral regurgitation, which in any case correlates with no events or less events. Indeed, well said. So with that, I'd like to move us along to the next section, and uh, Dr. Fabian Praz will be presenting that. We can have those slides. So thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Thank you to everybody for the, for the opportunity. Uh, so my task will be to translate this a little bit also into uh, in terms of, uh, of imaging and into how we can um, achieve uh, this, this uh, result of uh, less MR, of grade one uh, in, in most of the patient um, looking at some uh, imaging parameters. So what we have to, to, to take into account is of course, and everybody knows that, is that the anatomy of the, of the mitral valve, also the tricuspid valve, is much more complex and details play a much more important role than it is the case, for example, for TAVI patient on a patient with artic stenosis. We have a lot of structure here, as you can see, we have uh, a leaflet, we have different mechanisms of disease, we have the subalveolar apparatus that play a role, uh, we have a nanolus that is not a, a f just a flat structure, uh, but uh, really something um, uh, that can change also in the course of the disease uh, anatomic anatomically, and we really have to look uh, at this in terms of imaging, and this complexity translates into the need of a lot of different techniques, echocardiography uh, with the trans with transesophageal echocardiography and 3D advanced imaging. Uh, so you have really when you have when you start your program with Pascal or with uh, with other device, you will have to have somebody that is able to uh, uh, really understand the mechanism of the disease, to localize the lesion, and to provide you also with images able to give you the severity of the disease in a very accurate way. And we see this debate right now uh, around secondary MR that uh, this uh, severity of MR plays a very important role uh, in the response um, to the therapy as well. So if we, uh, if we look into this different valve, we see a lot of different anatomy. You have patients with prolapse, we see different size of the valve, uh, we see uh, different, um, uh, we see sometimes cleft as well and uh, some features that can be a contraindication uh, for uh, transcatheter uh, mitral uh, valve repair. And you will have to sort out a little bit uh, this patient during the pre-procedural planning. We know that anatomy plays a role and we know this uh, since Everest. Everest has very, uh, very strict inclusion criteria. Uh, the patient had to have a good coaptation uh, death. They had to have not too much tethering. They had uh, the, Plain gap was also limited, uh, and the, the size of the prolapse, so it was very strict 
anatomical uh, criteria. And this play a role also with the first generation of the device in terms of outcomes. We know that patients with, uh, with uh, less good results um, um, have, have also uh, less good prognosis. Um, with the time. Of course, we have to see that there have been a lot of development, technically speaking, in this domain. And these criteria from Everest have to be updated now with uh, new device, with different size uh, of the device uh, that can uh, allow a much more individual approach uh, of these patients. And one of the uh, attempts is to correlate a bit the the imaging characteristic of the patient with uh, the uh, experience of the center. So if you are less experienced, you will go for a patient with, uh, with a good valve area. Uh, if you have more experience, you can tackle the patient with some calcification, with a short leaflet, uh, or with even uh, bowel disease, with good outcome. And of course, always in discussion uh, with, uh, with the our team and your surgeon. So what you see here is a, a complex anatomy with a, a, a broad and wide uh, um, prolapse of the posterior leaflet, a patient that would probably not have been accepted in Everest. You will look at the localization of the lesion. You will measure the mitral valve area at the beginning to choose the size of the device, the kind of the device you will use, and the number of devices you are, uh, you are uh, projecting to use uh, to tackle this, uh, this anatomy. Of course, Imaging is still extremely important um, in terms of transeptal puncture and in terms of guiding, uh, but the new device we have are a, a, a lot, much more forgiving uh, in terms also of working lens and uh, can accommodate a, a, a higher working lens and more difficult anatomy uh, with, uh, with a good steerability in the left atrium. Some of the Landmark important, the aortic valve, the septum on the medial side, on the medial side and the left atrial appendage lateral. And when, then you will use X-plane, multi-plane imaging to be able uh, to steer your catheter, to localize the leaflet and to move the, the catheter in the right direction, check the path and have an optimal uh, angle of attack. You can do it also on 3D surgical view um, with uh, the classical one, which is the one with the aortic valve on top of the image, like you can see on the screen. Uh, you have then on the right side of the screen, the medial part of the valve uh, with the septum and the lateral part on the left side with uh, the left atrial appendage. And then that's a classical part of the imaging. And then now today, you have also to train your imager and to train yourself as an interventionalist to look at smaller details, like uh, in this case with Pascal, independent grasping, uh, which, as you can see here in that situation, allow you to grasp uh, the, the anterior leaflet with the clasp down in that situation, and then to go, that's the second image, uh, to go to the posterior leaflet and do a stage leaflet capture that can help you in difficult anatomy. Um, there is also technique to measure the leaflet insertions that have been uh, published and uh, recently described. You can measure on the medial and lateral side, the leaflet size, average it, look at the residual uh, leaflet part uh, that you can see, uh, and have an estimation of the leaflet insertion on, on that way, and optimize your result as well. And finally, something we do in every case, a little bit complicated, but very useful, is to look at the 3D mitral valve area to uh, be able uh, to, to uh, anticipate the gradient on the, on the next day. So I come to my conclusion. Precise preprocedural imaging is essential. 3D echocardiography plays a central role also for the assessment of the result. And of course, if you want to be a successful operator on mitral and tricuspid as well, you will need to have this understanding and to understand 3D and 2D echo imaging uh, during and before the procedure. Thank you very much. Fabian, that was excellent, and I cannot stress enough how important imaging is. It is everything. So we have two questions from our colleagues out in the community, and I'll read the first one and allow, uh, I think it relates a little bit more to Paolo's talk. It's from Dr. Omar Chahab. In the short term, are you concerned about sudden and complete abolition of MR in the high-risk patient who may have impaired left ventricular contractility? Oh, yes. Clearly, we have to 
take in mind that we are treating patients and not numbers. So uh, clearly, if you have a patient of, I would say, really high risk or, and really uh, fragile and also really old, I would say 89 years old, uh, maybe the expectancy of life could be impaired. So maybe you can, in that case, but in that particular case, you can forgive not abolishing MR. But also in low ejection fraction patients, I'm talking about patient that an ejection fraction that is more than 30% with a ventricle that is not too much dilated. I think that in any case, in that patient, you have to chase the course. As soon as you are going in patients that are outside the co-opt trial um, uh, measures clearly in that way maybe it's not useful to treat the patient so i don't know if you want to treat and to to have a symptomatic treatment for that patient you don't have to chase the call but here we are talking about survival and prognosis and if the patient is well selected with the right number of uh, dimension of the ventricle and ejection fraction you have to chase the color and no gradient good point so this leads me into the very next question it's from anonymous does a difference in 30-day mortality between surgical mitral valve replacement and repair signal that complete MR abolition is poorly tolerated from a hemodynamic perspective, at least in the short term? So, Edith, uh, your thoughts on that? So, um, I, I, I didn't get really the, the, the question uh, pretty well. So, uh, so you think that the short term is more important than um, the longer term? So what no, I, I think, found... I think what our questioner from our, our colleague is really asking is a buildup on the first question, essentially saying from our surgical colleagues, mitral valve um, replacement, there's a difference between mitral valve replacement and repair in their short-term outcomes. And perhaps that could mean abolition, getting rid of the MR completely is also a bad thing. I wanted your opinion on that. Um, I still believe that it's very important to reduce the mitral regurgitation and get at the end trace. Um, we found in our cohort also that if you have a discharge of mitral regurgitation of trace, and then after six months, you still have this good result, they have a better survival, less rehospitalization. So I still believe it's very, very important that you really reach the uh, reduction of the mitral regurgitation. No matter yeah, if I would build or I would only want to add that in, uh, surgically, uh, when we replace the valve for people that are not used to surgical field, we are removing the valve apparatus, which is really important ventricle. So I think that this is, it, it's very important point to explain maybe the mortality in surgical field. I agree, and I would also build on that the data from the CTSN trial of severe functional MR really showed that there was no survival benefit or difference uh, between repair and replacement, but certainly replacement had a better outcome in terms of uh, MR durability or reduction of MR durability. So with that, I think it gets into technology and where are we going with technology? And I'd like to uh, have Dr. Lubos speak as to this next section. Uh, so if we can have those slides back up for her. So it's really an honor for me to uh, get an idea about the key features and the latest data on the Pascal device. So what, what are the features? Um, so we have a central spacer. We have the possibility to elongate the Pascal device. It's a nitinol design and we have independent clasp. Recently, just the new Pascal Ace came out and it has a narrow profile and the central pacer designed to complement the Pascal for further optimized treatment uh, um, of the patients. So how does the Pascal look? So we have this Pascal implant. I talked about the central spacer and it has broad paddles and of course this independent leaflet capture. The Pascal delivery system has three components. It has, first of all, a 22 French guide sheath. Then we have a steerable catheter, and we have an implant catheter. The catheter maneuvering is possible in three independent planes, and independent catheters allow predictable implant positioning. So let's talk about, in my opinion, one of the main features. It's the spacer technology. The spacer fills the regurgitant orifice and box backflow. And you really can nicely see this in the echo. 
So what is the, the behind that? So the Pascal spacer reduces leaflet stress and increases open orifice area for lower gradients. There's this nicely study out where they were analyzing a finite element analysis in a mitral valve simulating the leaflet response to an implant. You can see on the link left side, there's an implant without a spacer, and on the right side, there is this Pascal implant, which shows a reduction of stress and also a 20% increase in open orifice area during diastole. So, and for the next slide, um, you can also have a nice other feature, which is the paddles. They create a wide area of simplified leaflet capture with less stress. So these white paddles avoid points of high leaflet tension. And increased coaptation and length are predictors of a successful mitral reg regurgitation reduction. So this super elastic nitinol implant design flexes when loaded. So besides that, we also discussed about this independent leaflet actuation. And the goal is to optimize the leaflet capture. So the primary usage is the leaflet capture, either both or individually, but you also have the secondary usage by stage leaflet capture. And then you also have the next slide, please. The possibility to have this optimized leaflet retention elements, the ensuring firm leaflet capture while minimizing tissue damage. And how is that possible? You have this horizontalized orientation of retention elements in line with collagen fibers orientation and density in mitral leaflets. The free edge of the mitral leaflet is primarily a soft spongiosa structure, and the Pascal targets midpoint of leaflets to engage retention elements. So, and this is one of the main and important also features of the Pascal. So, as you can see, by optimizing subvalvular maneuvering, you have the possibility if the Pascal goes down and you are in the left ventricle, you go post or anterior, you go medial or lateral, and you kind of hangled in the core, you have the possibility by elongating to ensure procedural confidence. So, in fact, um, you have this really, really great um, features, which uh, can be all together have this summarized. So you have the central spacer, you have independent leaflet graspering, and you have this device elongation. So this is about the uh, Pascal device, but what about the data that we have available? So this are the six months and one year outcome data from the class study. So this is a single arm multicenter prospective study to evaluate the safety, performance, and clinical outcome of the Pascal device. So we had around 100 patients in the intention to treat and roll on patients. And at six months, there were 99 patients follow up. But more important is the intention to treat patients where you have 62 and after one year, 54. So what are the data about that? 100% of the patients reached after one year a mitral regurgitation reduction less than two plus and 82 percent mitral regurgitation less than one plus and this sustained over a year how about survival and freedom from heart failure hospitalization after one year so 92 percent survival rate and 88 percent freedom from first heart failure rehospitalization but of course, there's just a low number of patients and data, so we are looking really for more numbers. And there is right now this class 2D2F trial running, which is this prospective multi-center randomized controlled pivotal trial, where the Pascal device is compared to the mitral um, system. And we have two arms for the degenerative and for the functional. And um, we are still waiting till we get the results. But we want to also know now what is the experience with the Pascal device from the first 1,200 commercially treated MR patients. And this are retrospective analysis. The data were collected by Edwards clinical specialists after acute assessment by implanter and echo. And the analysis were also performed by Edwards. Do, we didn't include echo core lab analysis or clinical event committee assessment. 
but still out of 1200 patients you had 56 percent functional mr so what is important about that we're talking about safety and efficacy so there's a 99.8 percent safety rate and even after a serious adverse event it's just freedom from 98.3 percent so how effective is this treatment you reached a mitral regurgitation reduction less than 97% and less than 1 plus in 73% of the patients. So, and what is also important that it just also comes with experience. So even after a short learning curve, you get much better results um, after five, 10 cases. And the time is also less important than during the operation. So if I con conclude, there is in the class study, which has a small number, a high survival and low complication rate, low rates of heart failure hospitalization, a robust and sustained mitral regurgitation reduction with 82% less than 1 plus and 100% less than 2 plus, and there is improvement in functional status, exercise capacity and quality of life. And this is also with the real world experience. So we have a low intraprocedural complication number, 80% reach trace. And so we also, after a short learning curve, get even better results. So thank you very much. Dr. Lubo, see if that was excellent. And I think uh, we don't have any questions yet from our colleagues on the chat, but I would welcome them. And in the meantime, Fabian and Paolo, questions for Edith on this. Yeah, maybe I can start. So, Edith, thank you very much for showing the data. We have to we have to keep in mind that um, the Pascal device is still a first generation device. Actually, you know, the, now of course we are coming to some some more feature with uh, with a second size uh, that you that you mentioned as well. We see we see ACE. So, what is what is Edith's your experience with this different size of the Pascal device? Do you think it's a it's a useful add? And uh, in which anatomy you will uh, you will combine this kind of uh, of device? So I just, uh, on Monday, I did a, a procedure and I used two ACEs. So you would think, why didn't she use a, a, the regular um, Pascal with this uh, spacer? But to be honest, there were two different pathologies. So there was a restrictive PML and there was also kind of flail prolapse in the anterior leaflet and a different segment. So if I ha had used just the Pascal, I would definitely have an increase in my gradient and I wouldn't be able because the wealth wasn't so uh, large I wouldn't be able to put two Pascal in it so it was really a nice idea to have two aces and I could really treat nicely the two pathologies I also would think that in smaller wealths where you have the possibility to just add maybe one uh, device I would also go for ace um, just because of the gradient, there's less tension. I really, really like the device a lot. And it, if you're going after disease closer toward the commissures where there's more cords present, do you think ACE allows you to get in there amongst the cords a little bit easier than the standard P10 Pascal? I'm, I'm just, you know, way more relaxed with the Pascal device because of the elongation. So I really also with the regular uh, Pascal, I, I went through the commissural and, you know, it was just uh, easier. But I believe that with the ACE, you can really also treat this way far commercial uh, defects and have not this issue with gradient or you have a spacer which kind of put half of your valve closed. So, Edith, could you please make a comment more about the elongation? So, do you think that the elongation can really help you in order to do different attempts in terms of safety and conf uh, confidence for the operator? I think there are two aspects. First of all, I'm way more relaxed with, you know, finding the perfect position because I have more... Uh, tries. I'm not that concerned that I'm harming leaflets by open and closing individual grasping and destroying or damaging the leaflet. So this is one point. So I'm way more relaxed in trying things, you know, and having also different pathologies treated. And second of all, definitely um, with the elongation, 
um, I'm, I'm so safe that I really am not concerned about hanging in the left ventricle and you know, getting not out of the system. So at least in my experience, it, it's pretty nice and it worked pretty fine. Great. So let's go on to a couple of cases that we have so that our colleagues can get a sense of this technology in action. Okay, so let's talk practically what we can do with our patient. This is a standard patient, iris patient with ischemic cardiomyopathy, severe mitral regurgitation with uh, fibrotic gener degeneration of leaflets and P2P3 clefts. So the wave area is 0.42, maybe a little bit more, 35% of ejection fraction, and it's a very dilated left atrium. So a typical example of iris patient that we are treating nowadays with these pathologies. As you can see here, there is a wide jet of non-cooptation, so maybe this uh, usually can be uh, treated with uh, two devices or uh, something more than one because the, 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 the non-cooptation is more than 50% of the, uh, the intercommissural area, as you can see here. So really severe mitral regurgitation. And again, another important aspect is the fibrotic tissue. So maybe this is a uh, valve that you would not try to attempt with different uh, uh, clasping because maybe you think you can, uh, you can have damage. And there is also a cleft between P3 and P3, as, uh, as you, you can see here. Again, the valve area is uh, uh, 3.5, so maybe a little bit less uh, studied at 3D during the procedure. And also, uh, the, the, we can show that it was really severe because the area, uh, the vena contracta area 3D is 0.27. So really severe mitral regurgitation. And this is the pulmonary flow. That is another uh, thing that we can look at when we treat our patient together with left atrial pressure that can be directly measured with the Pascal device. Yeah, this is the trajectory and uh, the trajectory towards colo. So standard of care, we have to be perpendicular towards uh, uh, the plane of the mitral valve, and you have to go exactly where the color is in order to achieve and uh, to reduce it. Here we are opening the device, and the feature also of uh, uh, independent clasping can be visualized during this maneuver when you can clearly understand where the anterior or the posterior clasp is. Again, the orientation on the left side, there is a wrong orientation because we want to follow the smile of the mitral valve. And on the right side, we have a, um, a device that is in the center, maybe a little bit on the medial aspect of the valve. That's why it is counterclockwise oriented. And also, use, uh, I, uh, I recommend to use also fluoroscopy in order to have the fluoroscopy that gives you the orientation of the Pascal device. So you know there that you are in the right orientation, and you, have a, you can gain this information during the clasping and the descent into the ventricle. Next slide, please. Yeah, as you can see, during the advancement of the ventricle, if you use echo and fluoro, you can clearly understand that the device does not rotate, which is really important. So you, get, you have this informant complementary information. Next slide. And here, the clasping. You retract the device, and then you go down with the clasp. Next slide. Okay, we, you see the bouncing of the leaflets. You don't have to worry because you have your leaflet inside the, uh, the device that cannot go out. So you can take your time in order to understand how much of the, of the leaflets are inside the Pascal device. Here, you can now see that anatomically you have a wonderful result, but if there is a residual mitral regurgitation. So you go for the next attempt. With the next attempt, as you can see, this is something that you can notice during your procedure and also Lim said before, sometimes since the Pascal is larger and this is an important feature, you can have a folding of the posterior leaflet. So you have to pay attention when you have this. And then to, have, to achieve a better result, you can try to leave the anterior leaflet inside the, the, the Pascal device and optimize the posterior leaflet clasping or do exactly a different maneuver. When you take the posterior leaflet only, and you go to get the anterior. So we are 
technically, practically talking about different attempts in order to achieve the best result. Okay, and at the end was this, uh, this uh, our, uh, our final result, which again was not perfect. Maybe it was sufficient, it was a good result in, uh, because the color is not that much, but we wanted to do it more. So what we do in these cases, we go only in three chamber view, looking at fluoro, the, the, the medial lateral uh, part of the, of the device. And only with this maneuver, we were able to achieve uh, our last result, which is, I would say, better than the two attempts done before. So we chase the color, we do different attempts, independent clasping, anterior and posterior, and using only uh, free chamber view. Again, we always evaluate uh, all the anatomy, also in transgastric view, and importantly, we look at the gradient. So one device, 3.6 of area, no MR, and two of mean gradient. Here is the final result anatomically with color and also on fluoroscopy. And the cleft was not uh, having residual matter regurgitation. So this was the pre, pretty wide regurgitation with an important vena contractor area at 3D and really no residual MR at the end of the procedure. Why do this was, uh, was achieved? Because uh, we trusted in doing several attempts despite the fibrotic tissue of the valve because elongation and the dependent glasping can give us the possibility to do so. This is the pulmonary flow. It was not completely normalized. The patient clearly needs uh, intraortic balloon pump and inotrope, but after seven days was discharged directly in the rehabilitation center. And this is the follow-up. Previous slide, please. And this is the six-month follow-up with no MR and no gradient. So again, we know today that residual MR is mandatory. Well-balanced between residual MR has, been, has to be achieved, but here with one device, we are able to optimize the result with elongation and independent grasping, reaching the optimal one. Paulo, that was an excellent example of something that Edith had just said. That essentially, you, it seems like you certainly have a lot more confidence, a lot more comfortability in being able to optimize the position of the device to get the optimal result. I really like to commend you on that. Oh, yes, so, this is really important mm -hmm. because uh, clearly uh, maybe there are operators that have as more experience, have done more cases. But from my point of view, as an operator and edit showed before, uh, they have a better, uh, really uh, short learning curve because since you are comfortable with the elongation, because I had my, my problems with uh, impinging in the corde, but not because I, I wanted to go into the corde, but you know, there is also human error and you can mitigate with the elongation because really you are comfortable to do more attempts. That's a great point. Uh, so, all right, let's so, go on to our second, more of a degenerative case uh, from Dr. Fabian Praz. So, thank you very much, Scott. Uh, that was uh, was a really uh, excellent case showing uh, optimization. And let's let's have a look how we can uh, do maybe the same in in a patient with uh, degenerative MR. So this one is a patient 81 year old uh, male. And that's interesting because that's one of the patients we treated during the very, very early experience with the Pascal device. It was actually during the compassionate use experience. So it was one of the first uh, patients treated uh, with, with Pascal worldwide. So he had severe primary mitral regurgitation. It was very symptomatic with, uh, with, uh, with shortness of breath and was also hospitalized for cardiac decompensation um, uh, many times uh, before we decided to treat him. And he had also been pre-operated. So that was probably one, uh, that was one of the main reasons uh, why he was, uh, it was decided to treat him with transcatheter therapy. Uh, it was, of course, a decision, a hard team decision, uh, because we were at the, at the beginning of the, exper of the experience with the device. Uh, the left ventricular function was already a bit of, uh, of reduced, uh, also because of the, uh, the associated um, 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 
ischemic disease uh, he, he had. Um, so uh, that's the anatomy. So as you can see uh, on, on these uh, pre-operative images, uh, we have a patient with uh, quite a large flail of the posterior leaflet, uh, a bit of a, of a strange anatomy, I have to say, uh, because we also have a, a cleft, uh, probably, of the, of the posterior leaflet or pseudo-cleft. Uh, so kind of a, a bit challenging anatomy. You cannot exactly know uh, what or predict what uh, will be uh, your, your result. So the jet was very eccentric. It was a very large jet, uh, but not very wide. Uh, but really filling the, the, the complete uh, left atrium due to this, uh, to this wide uh, flay leaflet. So we went into the procedure uh, with, with the transeptal puncture, as, as always, you can see our, our images, and uh, we did uh, this measurement as well, uh, and you can maybe not read it, but it was 5.5, so it's a bit uh, a bit high, actually, for uh, for uh, for a uh, normal edge-to-edge uh, -edge repair, uh, but you can do it uh, quite easily with the Pascal device. So the working lens uh, is is longer as as um, as as it was with uh, other device before, uh, so that you can accommodate uh, a bit of uh, of a higher uh, transeptal puncture. It gave the a little bit less of stability, um, in particular if you are if the device is inside of the jet. Uh, but but is uh, is uh, absolutely doable uh, with uh, with this system. So that was our first um, our first uh, grasping of the leaflet. That was actually not uh, so difficult uh, uh, as a first attempt. And you can see that we were already lucky to uh, to control a little bit of the cleft as well, and to have this uh, this segment uh, control. Uh, the, pro the, the flail segment control, and we had already a quite nice reduction of uh, of mitral uh, of the mitral regurgitation and a reduction of the left atrial pressure as well that you can measure uh, directly with a, with a device. But we are not completely happy because there was still this uh, eccentric check uh, that was uh, relevant in in our eyes. So what we do uh, uh, we did in that situation we did uh, an adjustment of the posterior leaflet. So you can see that the posterior leaflet is still moving uh, quite a lot. And we, uh, on this image on the right of the, of the screen, you can see that the clasp on the anterior side is still down, but we open the clasp on the posterior side. Then we move the device toward posterior in order to uh, control a little bit more of the posterior of the posterior leaflet. And we're then on that way able to have uh, a much better, a much better result. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a kind of, uh, of early example of what you can do with uh, optimization of the capture of the leaflet in a very gentle way, you know, without push, put, putting any, any uh, pressure or tension on the leaflet. You just open one of the clasps, move your system a bit uh, toward the direction you want to, to, to grasp and control more of the leaflet. And you can see on this image that uh, uh, the posterior leaflet is much, much better controlled after this, uh, this maneuver. Uh, mean gradient was four and we had trace MR and, uh, and the patient uh, was actually uh, doing uh, really well after the procedure and was not hospitalized again. So, I mean, that was a fantastic example of a, doing these complicated mitral valve disease very elegantly. Let me ask you this, because certainly in our earlier Everest two trial days, we would avoid any patients with significant indentations or clefts. And now that we have the ability to do independent grasping, there also seems to be the risk of torsion on the valve, which may open up the cleft or create more MR. What's your thoughts on that and how do you approach such patients? That's, that's I think, one of the very important points. And that's one also of the concern uh, linked to independent, uh, independent grasping, to torque a little bit of the valve. But I think it's also an opportunity and it gives you uh, the possibility to orientate uh, your device uh, in, a, in, a, in a direction that may help you to close uh, some, some cleft as, as well. You know, we, we are trying sometimes uh, to use some atypical orientation of the device. And in that situation, independent uh, uh, clasping can help you 
uh, to achieve uh, this situation. I don't think we know everybody about everything about the, about the treatment of cleft, and uh, for sure we are not successful in in all that cases. Uh, but I think having a larger device, a little bit of longer arm as well, and this ability uh, to to uh, to clasp independently the leaflet uh, can help us as well in this kind of anatomy. So, guys, uh, as a surgeon, I want to raise uh, an important, um, I would say, word of caution about uh, uh, independent clasping. I think that it's really important. And finally, we have it. But from a surgical point of view, I have to tell you that the, one of the goals of the edge to edge technique that was developed by my former chief, Professor Alfieri, is that uh, uh, you have to change for sure the amount of tissue that is inside in functional and degenerative, but the symmetry is really important. Uh, and so sometimes, maybe in less uh, experienced operator, uh, to maintain sim symmetry uh, with maneuvers could be. A little bit more difficult. So I would go for independent clasping, not as first attempt, but for sure I would use it for different attempts if the result is not good. And second, this is something that has been not uh, completely um, showed by our data, but remember that when you are trying to treat patient with uh, redundant tissue, so where for I'm talking about degenerative patient with redundant tissue and good ejection fraction, the risk of uh, losing the symmetry is higher than in functional patient when the ventricle is not moving too much and you have tethering and so the device cannot move uh, move less than in the generative. So only a word of caution, use it, but uh, be symmetric and be more symmetric when you are in the generative case because, as you said, Lim and uh, Fabian, the, the torsion of the valve and the asymmetric could lead to uh, pains of the valve and the residual MR. No, you I, know, um, I, I, I absolutely I, agree with that, uh, Paolo. And I, I think, you know, that the talking the device when you have one of the leaflets in is something you really uh, need to avoid. So you really have to set up your direction before clasping one or the other of the, of the leaflet and then avoid doing a torque on the device as you already have one of the leaflets in the class. I, I completely agree with Paolo. At the first time, you know, we were so excited with this individual grasping. So we just kind of used it from the beginning and to have a discharge echo sometimes because of the hemodynamics, the different situation of the valve, you know, um, normally you get a really better result as discharge, but with the individual grasping, sometimes you really can change the anatomy. And then, you know, you get maybe not that better result that you actually expected because, you know, if the patients are really on a normal situation, you know, then you have the real um, echo data available. And um, I would definitely say, you know, for the mitral valve, definitely try at least not to go for the individual. And for the tricuspid valve, it's a completely different story. So Fabian showed an elegant case of doing something that's very complicated, mitral valve anatomy. Are there other areas, I'm wondering, now with these advancement of technologies that we can proceed, I'm thinking of, say, perhaps smaller mitral valve areas. In the past, particularly in the Everest trial days, we would limit ourselves to mitral valve orifice areas above four centimeters squared. With this technology, um, do you, Fabian or Edith, do you feel more comfortable tackling patients with smaller valves? Definitely. I definitely think that because um, with the Abbott clip, it closes completely. And uh, with the Pascal, you ha have more the hemodynamic. The, so the Pascal really follows the hemodynamic of the heart. It's not closing. It's not putting so much tension. So in my opinion, the gradient is definitely um, less. And so I definitely go for uh, smaller mitral valves with a Pascal device instead of the, the Abbott clip. Um, and yeah. No, you know, and as I, as I, I showed uh, or tried to show in my talk, I think you know, the, the, the criteria we were using for uh, selecting patients need to be rethinked with, with that new device because we, we are certainly able to go uh, down to, to, to smaller valve area. We are probably able also with, uh, with, leaflet, uh, with less leaflet tension to tackle also uh, calcified leaflet 
you know, all this has to be, uh, of course, discussed with a surgeon, has to be uh, discussed with a patient. And I think we are getting better also in predicting, in predicting the results and um, looking at anatomy and seeing what what are our expectancies in term in terms of results. And all this uh, need to be uh, to be uh, discussed with with the patient and and with the and with the surgeon in the in the heart team. But of course, these uh, anatomy criteria uh, need to be more related, I think, to the to the experience of the center and of the operator, of the echocardiographer as well, uh, than uh, really as a strict uh, inclusion criteria like it was in, in Everest. So building on that, in Everest, we really didn't enroll, nor in COAP, nor in Mitre FR, any patients with Carpentier type 1 disease, where the leaflets were relatively flat. And certainly there's a concern in that type of anatomy. If we use a mitre clip that pulls that all together, we're really causing a lot of stress on the leaflets. But do any of you have significant experience with the Pascal device in Carpentier 1? And would you consider using the P10, regular Pascal, versus this new ACE device? Uh, I don't have experience with the Pascal device. I have experience with the CardioBand, with this type of patient. But uh, from, from, from what I can say is that uh, type 1, purely type 1 uh, mitral regurgitation, it's, uh, it's a rare device. It's a rare disease. And, but as you said, in this case, you can go directly with, with a spacer that gives you the possibility to reduce the stress, la, stress like Edith showed before on the leaflet and leaving the VAR well open in diastole. So no doubt that uh, this could be a complementary, can, can have a complementary uh, usage in this type of anatomy. But as a surgeon, this is at least my, my experience that purely type one, it's something that uh, it's it, uh, it, it's usually type one and three B, so something like more more complex. There is always a quote of tethering. The the uh, AFib uh, mitral regurgitation, I would say, it's it's uh, it, it's happen. It's it's more common now, but it's not so 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 present. This is at least my experience. Well, Paolo, I would challenge you on that. No, you know, I, I, I think we're going to see a lot more coming down the pike, Fabian. So no, exactly. You know, I just wanted to react on uh, on atrial um, mitral agitation, which is kind of of new entity. It, I mean, it has always existed, but uh, it's something we are a little bit more aware of now. And and the risk I see with mitral clip and with this very fa uh, flat coaptation is to is a gradient. So it's most of the time it's a rather uh, small anatomy where you really have a risk to, to create a create a gradient. I don't know if if surgery can can. Uh, can have better outcome in that in that kind of anatomy. It's it's possible. We don't know yet. There's not so much data on the, on the treatment of this patient, but that's certainly something that we may be able to better address with different uh, device uh, sizes, uh, also with uh, with leaflet approximation. Uh, but there there is concern that you you create a bit uh, you create gradient, and you may it may look actually very simple to treat because uh, the leaflets are, are, are not tethered and quite easy to grasp. But then uh, you you create very easily and rapidly gradients. Not, not a very easy uh, easy uh, disease. Yeah. Well, I agree with you. The concept of having a spacer involved so you're not pulling those leaflets as closely together is a very uh, attractive one for those Carpentier type 1s. And I mean, additionally with the ACE, you know, maybe this could be also, you know, the device of choice, you know, in this kind of patient. So, you know, it's an interesting concept. I think we're going to learn a little bit more with time in which patients do we use which device. There's certainly, um, so I'd also appreciate all of your thoughts in the time we have here. There's some patients that have some degree of calcium, scattered bits of calcium. I'm not talking about severe rheumatic disease, but that, um, that may be near where you want to grasp. Does that impact your choice of device? I think that uh, I would be more comfortable uh, with a little bit of calcium uh, instinctively from what I saw looking at the device and his movement into the valve. I would feel more comfortable to use uh, 
a Pascal device. But uh, uh, clearly, this uh, this statement should be uh, should be proven by uh, by by what we see in uh, in in our operatory room. Sure, it seems that it seems a little bit more physiologic, and the bouncing of the leaflets inside the device could help uh, maybe to be less aggressive. But uh, again, it's something that has to be demonstrated and. Maybe in the next webinar we can have interesting data about that. I mean, there is. I agree with with Paolo. We are not there. Uh, we are not there yet. But there is one interesting signal of that. Uh, you know, Edith mentioned this uh, closing, the different closing mechanisms, the different tension on the leaflet. And what we see from the the early data coming is a very uh, very low rate of uh, single leaflet device attachment uh, with uh, with Pascal. So that's already an interesting signal um, that uh, that something maybe is there in the way uh, the device is uh, is uh, putting tension on the leaflet or uh, handling with lesion that are that are calcified. Uh, but of course, we will need uh, much more data. We will need head-to-head -head comparison of this of this uh, device uh, to be able to to be more precise. That's a good point. So in the last bit here, what I'd like to do is we're in the middle of a worldwide pandemic with COVID-19, and that certainly has effect on our patients with valve disease. There's a recent uh, presentation at TCT from the um, COVID-19 registry in which they found patients with significant severe valve disease. One of the highest issues was in patients with mitral valve disease and 50% survival of only a month. So I'd like to ask all of your thoughts on that as we wrap this up. Does that affect the timing of when we should be recommending intervention on such patients? Edith or Fabian, your thoughts? So, you know, I, I think that's that's a very difficult and timely topic. What we know, uh, and there, are, there have been, I think, two studies on that, and one uh, was uh, from our center in Bern. We know that deferring uh, procedure as some on valvular patient, we did it on uh, on aortic stenosis. We know that this has consequences in terms of event and in terms of, of our patient are feeling. We, we did not see uh, uh, a clear signal on mortality, but uh, there are consequences uh, on that. And of course, we need to take into account the situation uh, of the hospital, uh, but we need to find, I think, a balance uh, between deferring this kind of procedure, but also treating patients that are uh, really in need. Uh, so we try to define, and that was done by the ESC as well, we try to define some criteria uh, that were important to, to see which valvular patients are in need of an early procedure. Yeah, and I totally agree. I mean, there are a lot of patients that are feeling, I would say, better um, now because they don't want to go to the hospital. Um, and I think that we underestimate the, the symptoms of the patients because they're less honest than before. They go less to the hospital. They are not really, you know, taking care um, so much right now because they're scared of doctors, hospital and all the stuff. So I think we really have this in mind, you know, and um, talking to the patient by phone or video call or whatsoever and really taking their symptoms in account. You know, I think this also speaks to the importance of quantifying MR because there's a, it's really important that we define the patients that have severe MR as opposed to the patients that don't. And it speaks to having quantitative measures uh, that, that ACE is recommending for all of our centers. Um, I think that Fabian's talk really showed the importance of that and importance of working as a team. So with that, I'd like to close this session, I think, uh, and I'd like to congratulate and thank every one of you, uh, Paolo, Fabian, Edith. This was an excellent series of talks. I hope we've done a great job in educating our colleagues around the world in this disease, and there's more to come. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. Thanks to you, Scott. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Peace. Thank Peace you, Fabian. Safe.